Hi, everyone. Welcome and thanks for joining us today. Um, We're excited to have you all here for this session. The title of the session is AI, Are We There Yet? And we're going to talk about uh, where we are in the continuum of artificial intelligence and where we see things going with our crystal ball over the next five to 10 years or so. Um, uh, quick introductions. My name is Reed Humphrey. I'm the Vice President of Technology Consulting for Canopy Partners. We're an AI and IT consulting firm that focuses in the radiology space. I'm joined today by Dr. Nina Kotler, who is the Associate Chief Medical Officer for Radiology Partners. Radiology Partners is the largest on-site physician practice for radiology in the country, serving more than 3,000 hospitals. Just a quick financial disclosure, neither of us have any relevant financial interest in any of the topics that we're talking about today. Uh, although if anybody has any stock picks in AI, we'd love to hear them. We'll, uh, we'll just kind of start with a quick overview of the market and introduction and, and the background on AI and imaging. We'll talk about some of the challenges and possibilities that are out there, including some different reasons why AI hasn't been completely embraced and adopted in the market. Um, also, uh, some examples of where it is in use and working successfully in clinical and private practice. We'll come back at the end and talk about some of the key components of a successful AI strategy, how to deploy AI, some things you need to think about. Um, that are not just the software costs, but some of the behind the scenes hidden costs that can can sometimes get you. And um, and then we'll come back and take some closing thoughts and questions. So with that, uh, we will jump right in and um, and we'll get going with things. And Dr. Kotler and I will kind of tag team back and forth as, as we go through today's presentation. So um, in, in terms of uh, just a quick history lesson, back in the 90s when I first got exposed to radiology, this is what the reading rooms looked like. Uh, there were light boxes and dictaphones and um, you know plain films. The RADs were at the center of patient care and other physicians came into the reading room often to consult and collaborate on patient care. And the radiologist was, was really at the, at the center of things. It was the, the radiologist was the doctor's doctor. Um, back, back in those times, there was a lot of, uh, of quality and we spent a lot of time reading exams and um, things were just a little different. And so as we moved into the 90s and into the early 2000s, technological advancements came along and they changed the way that radiologists work and the speed and accuracy of which we could provide interpretations. Um, this technology was a good thing and it was helpful, but it, it just uh, it caused um, some significant changes in the way that RADs work. Uh, probably the most significant contributor to this was PAX. PAX was a huge breakthrough and it came along frankly at just the right time because the growth in imaging services exploded over the next decade and we needed PAX and other new technologies like NLP voice recognition to help us keep up. Between 2000 and 2011, the healthcare industry experienced an 80% growth in imaging, but only 25% growth in the number of radiologists. So obviously there was a huge gap there and it was hard to keep up with the demand. So what did we have to do? Well, even with the new tools, radiologists had to read faster. They had a hard time keeping up. There was a lot of pressure on the radiology teams to, to read more volume, crank out more work RVUs, and have faster turnaround times. The technology helped us to do this, but anytime when people do things faster, there's usually a compromise somewhere else. And for radiologists, this meant more studies and less time spent on each study, less time consulting with other physicians about cases. In short, radiology became more transactional less relational and we lost a lot of our value in the process so let's forward to the present day the demand for imaging services continues to rise and we're facing a significant radiology shortage yet again we need to continue innovating and developing new technologies to help rads not only read faster yes that, that's important but with greater accuracy and specificity we need to get back to what we had in the past with radiology at the center of patient care, collaborating with referring physicians, administrators, and patients, providing rich information, sharing that information in our learnings, 
uh, communicating effectively and having um, detailed follow-up. So looking into the future, the quadruple aim of radiology is to incorporate the patient experience, identify and affect outcomes, move into predictive and prevention care, and provide more specialized and personalized medicine. This is where we see things going. And this is where AI comes in. We've been hearing about AI for many years, but it's only in the past 12 to 18 months that we've seen it beginning to gain traction in live clinical production. So our team at Canopy works with health systems across the country developing IT and AI strategies. And so we've seen kind of where this is working, but also where it's failed um, and, and where some of the challenges are. But right now, we're aware of more than 600 major hospitals that are actively using imaging AI in live production, not only to help the RADs read more effectively, but also to improve patient outcomes and drive measurable benefits and downstream return on investment for the health system. So we've reached a tipping point with AI, and it's starting to take root, and we believe there's no going back. Radiology is the most technology-centric specialty in healthcare, so we should make it our mission to lead and innovate and leverage this technology to improve patient care and outcomes. At the same time, we need to create new value, value that raises quality and decreases cost. The only way to achieve all of this is to embrace and leverage technology, in particular AI. We believe the future is gonna be uh, the radiologist at the center of care, working with AI to provide a higher standard of care than we do today. So this is where we see things going in the future and we're gonna take some time now to kind of unpack this and talk further. So I'd like to transition now to Dr. Kotler to share some of the clinical quality impacts and things that she's seeing uh, from her perspective in the marketplace. Thank you, Reed. And although I'm starting with the challenges of AI, I have to say that I'm really excited about what our future is gonna be. I am convinced that radiologists plus AI together, we're gonna to completely transform and disrupt the industry of what we're doing to provide better care for our patients. And ultimately, that's what it's all about. So I'm not the only one that believes this, that AI is going to help us transform uh, the practice of medicine. Venture capital has spent literally billions of dollars in this investment on AI. So then the question is, you've got people that are really excited. It's a great technology. There's billions of dollars being spent on it. Why isn't it being deployed everywhere? We're gonna talk through seven reasons why. We'll go through one at a time. And I'll talk through the most common portions of each one. But again, I am really excited about this technology and these are all things we can overcome. We just have to be aware of them. All right. Number one, the business case of AI. Uh, when, when we first started and AI vendors were coming to us uh, and telling us, hey, you should buy our product, right? It costs money. There's not a lot of extra money to spend in healthcare. So what do we do? Well, the business, the business case they came to us with was we're going to replace radiologists. And, um, and that clearly doesn't work. Uh, we've proven that. Hopefully, everyone has noticed that in the past 12 months. AI really doesn't have the ability to replace radiologists. It's not a good choice. AI plus RADs together are better than either one alone. Now, I will say that the vendors have recognized that, and they've started to change their, their business plan. They come to us now as a radiology practice, and they say, well, we can improve your efficiency. And that does have some business case for me, and, um, and to some point. I think the bigger area of a business use case is in how it benefits the hospitals and the patients. And so when they go to the hospitals, we're hearing them talk about increased reimbursement to the hospital, increased dollars coming in with more patients, and decreasing costs with decreasing length of stay and increasing ED throughput. All right, number two, the maturity of AI. Even though we're starting to get a better business case, AI is really not that mature in the marketplace. So here's the Gartner hype cycle. Uh, Gartner is an information technology firm that is also a consulting firm that created this curve. And the curve talks about the maturity of any new technology within our space. And it is based on Amar's law. Amar's law is the fact that we tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the short run, and we underestimate its effect in the long run. 
So here's the curve with time on the x-axis and visibility of the product on the y-axis. The technology trigger in this case is artificial intelligence. And uh, here's where Gardner and also I think that we are right now within the maturity of AI. We've come over the peak of inflated expectations where everyone said, oh, you're, you're not going to need RADs anymore. And you can see now we, we actually need more RADs than we ever needed before. But we're starting to get into some negative press. And my suspicion is that over the next year or two, we are going to start consolidating in the industry. There are hundreds of AI vendors. There's over 100 FDA cleared products just in radiology. And those vendors are going to start consolidate as they realize they're not all getting the dollars that they need to, um, to pay back the venture capital that's got into it. So how do you choose the right vendor? It becomes hard when there's hundreds to pick from, but you don't know which ones are gonna be around in the next year or two. Data, we know that artificial intelligence is extremely data hungry and it doesn't need any kind of data. It needs structured data. And in radiology, all of our data is unstructured. And frankly, I don't know a lot of radiologists who have a lot of extra time or want to spend a whole bunch of time labeling examinations. And so it's really difficult to get the kind of data that AI needs. Now, the other thing is that we think our data is beautiful and it looks like this, when in fact our data is really messy. Our data is sitting in silos, there are proprietary components of it, even though we have quote standards with ICOM and HL7, those standards you could really drive a truck through. And so it makes it very difficult to actually use all of the data, get it all in one place and make sure things are normalized so that the AI can benefit from it. Bias and context, hopefully you've heard a little bit about bias and there I could do a whole talk on bias. Uh, we only have a little bit of time. So I'm gonna go through my two sort of favorite and I think the two most important components of bias that I'm thinking about today. So here's, uh, if you're gonna remember anything from this session, I hope you remember this slide. The, uh, there's something called sample bias, which is what causes the lack of generalizability of an AI algorithm. It's what causes what people call the brittleness of AI. When you think about a radiologist, we could walk from one hospital, go down the street to another hospital, read and interpret examinations from different workstations, different protocols without a problem. But if you try to do that with AI, it doesn't work. So why is that? It's because of what we call sample bias. If the training data is different from your data, then the accuracy of the algorithm is not going to be the same when it's applied to your own data in your own environment. So how could your data be different? Well, imagine if the study or the model was trained on a different level of magnet strength, 1.5 Tesla instead of three. What if the, the um, CTs that they trained on were used at a different phase of contrast enhancement? So expiratory phase, or even here, it was only a few years ago where really everyone was getting oral contrast and now very few people are getting oral contrast. So if the training data was on older data, then they're all gonna have oral contrast. And if you use your data now, it probably doesn't. These things make a difference. There's a whole bunch of other areas that make a difference, whether it's about the data itself, the quality of the exam, the protocol, the scanner itself, or the patient population and the disease population. These are things that change over time. And so the accuracy that you hear from the vendor is the accuracy that they have done against their training data, their validation and test data. It may not be reflective of the accuracy in your institution. Here's the other component of bias that I think is really important to keep in mind. And it's uh, automation bias. Automation bias is the fact that we as humans tend to trust automated systems almost more than we trust our own instincts. So this happened, this is a picture, it was really not hard to find. Um, when GPS first came out, people were turning the wrong way down one-way streets, they were turning into parked vehicles, they were driving, in this case, into lakes. And when, when they were asked, hey, why did you do this? Why did you turn the wrong way down the street? They said, well, the GPS told me to do so. And, um, and it's not something to laugh at, it's something that's really important. We as humans naturally have a tendency to listen to an automated system. These AI systems are automated systems. It's really important for the radiologist to understand how it works because they're not always correct. 
And we can't just blindly trust the results of the AI system. So the implementation and the education that you do of your radiologist is really important to combat automation bias. All right, context. Now, AI does not understand context unless it's been told about the context. And here's an example. My husband's a huge sports fan. Uh, we live in San Diego, don't have any uh, basketball in this area. So my husband wanted to get uh, Clippers season tickets up for LA. He bought those season tickets and then for a couple of months after, he was getting Google ads for hair clippers, right? A very different kind of clippers, but it's just a difference in context that the AI was not taught about and so it might not know. The same thing happens with medical AI. All right, now the FDA is an organization that oversees a lot of our artificial intelligence products. Uh, these products are considered medical devices in many cases. And with that, they need to go through an FDA clearance. Now the FDA is supposed to evaluate for safety and it does a really good job of that. But one thing I wanna make you aware of is while it is evaluating the quality of the algorithm, the accuracy of the algorithm, making sure that they've at least looked at a few different data sets, it's not evaluating how that algorithm is going to work in your environment. So here's an article that I found last year through the MIT Technology Review, and it was talking about Google's medical AI for diabetic retinopathy. And this is nothing against Google. They had a great AI system. In fact, it was super, super accurate in a lab, but real life was a different story. And when they went to deploy it, they were deploying it in Thailand. It was being used in ways that they just didn't expect um, with, with different kind of users, uh, not having the internet connections that they expected. There were so many things that were different than they were in the lab that it didn't function the same way. So what's really important is that you need to understand how the AI is gonna work, not just on your data, but also in the context of your environment and the way that you um, and your radiologists work. All right, orchestration is one of my favorite subjects, and, uh, and I'm gonna show you what orchestration is. It's essentially the movement of data, and we absolutely need to move data when we're talking about AI. We need to either have a report, um, if the AI is an NLP system, or we have an image, if you're using computer vision, these have to get forwarded to the AI, the AI performs its function, and then they get forwarded somewhere else. Right now that, that forward is usually to the radiologist through, um, through the PAC system or somehow into their workflow. So what is orchestration? Orchestration is the movement of the data. It is both of these arrows. Now, I'm only gonna have time today to talk about the first part. So this is orchestration part one. It's how do you get your data to the AI system and why is this important? And hope maybe in another time we can talk about part two. All right, let me go through some examples. And with these examples, we're gonna learn four lessons about orchestrating your data. So why is it important? Uh, a friend of mine is a pediatric radiologist and he told me about this great online AI model that evaluates a child radiograph for bone age. Um, now, just to let you know, no AI algorithms for bone age right now are FDA cleared, but there are some that are available and online, and this one won a competition, so a very good algorithm. I tested it out, I grabbed a left-hand PA radiograph of a child, and I sent it to the algorithm, and it gave me a great result. It gave me a predicted bone age, it gave me the gender, it can compare that to the chronologic age, and it did all of this in one second. Fantastic, and why was that result fantastic? Because it was an appropriate exam to send to the AI. It was a left-hand PA in a child. So what happens if you send something that's not appropriate? And in this case, wildly inappropriate. A mammogram, even flipped on end. I just grabbed this off the internet, said, what would happen if I sent this to my AI system? Well, the AI system evaluated it and it told me that this patient was a 13 year old male. A right? completely invalid results because I sent it a poor modality, not even the right modality. If I knew that this was a mammogram or if the AI system knew this was a mammogram, it would not have evaluated it. All right, is modality enough? No, actually a lot of AI systems don't read the entire study. 
they will read one series of the study. In fact, for this intracranial hemorrhage algorithm, it's interpreting the axial series. So if I send in an axial series for this non-contrast head CT, it will appropriately tell me that on this study, there's no intracranial hemorrhage. But what if I sent it the sagittal image from the same exam? The Falk's calcification is now in a different location. It may not recognize that this is Falk's calcification. It may look at it and determine that it is hemorrhage. So you cannot send the right, you cannot send the wrong series. If I knew that this was a sagittal series and not the axial series that the algorithm was actually trained on, then I would not have sent it or the AI should not have taken it. Okay, so right modality, right series, is that enough? No. Here is a patient. In this case, we've got a left-hand radiograph, and it is a PA radiograph, so all those things are correct. But in this case, it's an adult. So you can see there's arthritis. I send that to the algorithm, and yes, it interprets it again, and it tells me that the patient is 17 and a half years old. Clearly not right. This patient is around 70. It was an inappropriate exam to send. If the, the AI knew that this was an adult, it wouldn't have taken it to begin with. All right, last example. This is supposed to be a CTPA exam, right, for a pulmonary embolus. But you can see that the contrast opacification in the pulmonary artery is not optimal. It looks more like a CTA exam. Now, in our practice, we use two different algorithms to evaluate for PE. One is for a high quality exam, one that's meant to be a CTPA study, but a high quality one. That interprets um, and it looks for PE in, in exams that have high contrast opacification within the pulmonary arteries. Then we have another that is meant for sort of incidental PEs where maybe you're doing a CT abdomen and pelvis or just a CT chest width and it's not time to be EPE or in this case where it is timed poorly and you don't have great contrast opacification of the pulmonary arteries. Why do we do that? Because if you train it on a smaller set, you can bet better accuracies than have one that's generalizable to both. But if the study comes across as a quote CTPA, it's immediately gonna go to the high quality C, uh, PE algorithm. And so you're gonna get lesser quality results. Wouldn't it be better if we knew that the study had lower contrast opacification in the pulmonary arteries, because in that case, we would make a better choice and we would send it to the incidental PE algorithm and get a better accuracy. So what have we learned from orchestration? We learned four lessons. We need to send the right series of the right study for the right patient to the right AI model. And that requires some work. It's not automatic just based on your DICOM header or different tags. And all of this, although you know, there are difficulties, and I mentioned seven of them, that seems like a lot, and there's even a few more that I didn't mention. Even though they seem like difficulties, these are all things we can overcome. And I believe very strongly that together, if AI is working with a radiologist, if we have human cybernetic collaboration and practice or academic center with vendor collaboration, we can overcome all of these and really transform the practice of radiology and medicine. All right, so let's get back to some of the possibilities of AI and talk about where can they be used. So when you think about where AI can be used in radiology, radiology is too big of a space to think of it as on its own. It is much easier to split up the components of radiology into what we call the life cycle of an examination. From the moment that a referring clinician has a clinical question, they wanna order a study all the way through the acquisition, the interpretation, the follow-up and peer learning, every single segment of this can be optimized with artificial intelligence, and in fact, it is. So here's examples being used today, and many of them are in fact FDA cleared. There's even uses of artificial intelligence within the workflow that lies completely outside of it, and frankly, it's an area I'm really excited about. But what I'm gonna to talk to you today for the examples are the most common use right now of artificial intelligence. It requires the least amount of regulatory oversight, and that is CAD-T. So what is CAD-T? CAD-T is a triage model. Triage models are essentially a detection model where you detect, the, the, the AI uses computer vision, and it will detect a certain thing, usually a pathologic finding. That pathologic and often critical finding is then communicated with your work list. 
The work list is then aware of where there are pathologic findings. It alerts the radiologist and hopefully the work list can then reorder the study. Now this on its own is actually fairly exciting. When you think about how Reed talked about radiology in the 90s, it, even though we've digitized radiology, our work lists have not changed that much. When I first started reading, I had a stack of radiographs that I had to go through. And I would just go through them in the opposite order they were received. I read the oldest one first. Well, digitized work lists are very similar. We read the oldest one first. Yes, we add in some SLA agreements. Yes, we add in some prioritization. But we don't know what the pathology is. You don't know anything about what is in the image until a physician looks at it. But with artificial intelligence, you can get that information in advance. So all of that pathology can come to the top of your work list. Now, this may not make a huge difference for your stack cases where you're reading them maybe in 15 minutes already, uh, certainly for a stroke case. However, it should have a bigger effect on your outpatient imaging and even your inpatient. You know, some inpatient studies aren't read for an hour or even four hours. You can fast forward that and make sure that they get taken care of more quickly. All right, so is that it? Um, there is more, and we ran a six-month pilot back in our practice using two different CAD triage models, one for intracranial hemorrhage and one for PE. And we found not only did it allow us to get to the pathologic findings faster, it actually helped us improve detection. Right? We're human. We miss things. We know that. Um, AI misses things, too. But AI and radiologists together can detect more than either one can alone. So in intracranial hemorrhage, we found that with AI, we were detecting 2.4% additional findings, and with PE, 4.4% additional findings. And the images on the bottom are actual findings that the radiologist initially missed that the AI picked up. And you can see that both of these cases are pretty subtle. And we did tend to see that the cases that the radiologists were missing were fairly subtle. And it raises the question of, well, does it matter? Could we ignore subtle findings? I mean, that may sound ridiculous, but you could imagine, do, do we know that subtle findings really drive value? What if we treated all of these patients with subsegmental PEs and you had more complications than you ended up having for a benefit? Or what if you brought in all of these patients with these super tiny hemorrhages? Uh, you may add up more cost to the system. And I think we're gonna find a lot more as we start to use AI more, but I will tell you already anecdotally that we know that that's not the case, that some of these even super subtle findings are really important. So here's an example. This was a 72 year old patient who came in with altered mental status. They came into one of our emergency departments. The study was read as chronic findings, right? Initially called essentially negative, uh, but the AI picked up a really subtle small acute subdural hematoma sitting along the left aspect of the calvarium. And, um, and so we called this patient back in. When they came in, it was 36 hours later. And in that time, the hemorrhage increased significantly. Now, this was not a patient that had trauma. They came in with altered mental status. This was not a patient who was on Coumadin, but yet this really tiny hemorrhage increased significantly, so much so that it was causing mass effect on the brain, compressing the left lateral ventricle and causing left to right midline shift. The patient actually required a craniotomy. They needed surgical decompression. And so we can't just ignore, even though it's a finding looks really subtle, it may turn into something big. And over time, the more of these we figure out, especially if we combine it with data from the EMR, we'll be able to say, yeah, this is a patient that you probably should keep in-house because they are at higher risk for developing a larger hemorrhage. And this is a patient that maybe you could send home. All right, so um, is there opportunity for improvement just for intracranial hemorrhage and PE? No, there are opportunities for improvement really everywhere. Uh, published miss rates are generally up to, you know, in the 10%-ish range, but up to 40% in some cases. And when you're talking about an incidental PE, what do I mean by incidental? One that we're not expecting. So a PE that's sitting in the lung bases when you're doing a trauma study for CT abdomen pelvis with contrast. Radiologists intend, uh, tend to miss those even more frequently. But if you add AI with that, the radiologist plus the AI can improve significantly. All right, so let me start there with, um, end here with just 
where I think we're going with an AI-enabled radiology future. I don't think that we're gonna need less radiologists. I don't think the AI is gonna do all of the work of the radiologists, but they are gonna complement each other. I actually think that the AI and all of the data that we get, whether it's through radiomics or genomics, all of that information has to be interpreted by someone. And I think that person is gonna be the radiologist. And this may be a very simple or a silly picture I, I grabbed off the internet. I mean, radiologists were not maybe gonna be in front of this big screen and it's not minority report. But I do think we're going to have to be the information experts of the future. We are going to have to be the group that understands and interprets all of this additional data that's coming through from all of these different sources because they're not all 100% accurate and we need to interpret them and interpret them in context. We then need to provide that information back to our referring clinicians and back to even our patients to make sure that they understand it and they have the information they need. We will go back to being the consulting physician for our physician. All right, with that, I'm gonna pass it back to you, Reed. Thanks, Dr. Collar, I appreciate it. Love the Minority Report reference as well. <laughs> um, that's, I haven't seen that one in 20 years, but that was, that was a very good movie. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about AI deployment. How do you actually implement this? What are some of the things that you need to, uh, to think about? Um, and first, let me just kind of share with you a, a sample architecture of typically the way AI is deployed if you're working with an outside vendor. If you are developing something in-house, obviously it's gonna look a little different, but most of the commercial applications that Dr. Kotler referenced work something like this. So um, kind of starting from the left-hand side inside of the green box, you've got the packs or your archive or the modality where the images are coming off of. Those images are um, coming into the orchestrator in a DICOM format typically. Um, and then just to the right of the, of the green box, you see the AI orchestrator. And this is that function that Dr. Kotler talked about of trying to um, assess what type of data is this and what type of AI needs to be um, applied to it. Um, so the orchestrator is sort of the traffic cop that's directing all of this. This is all happening within the firewall of, of your respective hospitals and health systems. But then that information typically is getting sent out to the cloud somewhere where the AI software as a service is running. So what happens is um, the information and the study live inside of your firewall, but then the, the PHI gets stripped out of the information when the image is sent to the AI up in the cloud. So actually it's all de-identified information that goes to the um, AI in the cloud off to the right. And then the algorithms are run against that study. And then the findings are sent back to your facility and back to your firewall. And at that point, the information is re-identified and basically attached back to that patient record so that inside of your house, you know uh, what patient it's associated with. So no PHI ever leaves your facility. It's just analyzing the image and sending back what the AI finds. And then uh, down at the bottom, this information can then be distributed out to the work list where the radiologist is, is reading the exam and having their uh, kind of their cue teed up for them. It can also be provided on a widget that the radiologist can check. And in a lot of cases, um, the radiologists have it appear both on their work list and there's also a separate widget that widget can be accessed not only by the RADs, but also by technologists and potentially other referring MDs uh, along the, the, the continuum of care. So this is typically how it works. It's pretty straightforward. It's a, it's a fairly lightweight deployment uh, that doesn't require a lot of bandwidth or infrastructure or resources on, on the health system side of things. Uh, on the next slide, if you could advance, please. This is what a typical implementation looks like. Um, you know, there's a there's a few steps here. I won't walk you through each of these steps, but um, you know, I think that the key here is that this is not a heavy lift. Um, it it can be installed in as little as you know two weeks, maybe up to 45 days, um, and most of the work is typically done by the AI, um, you know, whoever the AI provider is, 
and uh, there's not that much work that has to be done on the hospital health system side of things. So pretty straightforward from an implementation. But there are some challenges to adoption beyond just technically installing the AI. Um, at the end of the day, we have to make the AI tools work for the clinicians. That includes the radiologist, and you may have different types of radiologists, some employed, some private practice, or locums, or telerad. But it also has to work for the referring physician community and the um, administrators and the techs. And it's not just one type of AI tools. Um, you know, as Dr. Kotler mentioned, there are 100 plus approved FDA tools out there. So how do you go about this? Are you going to have 100 different implementations of things and then try to coordinate those and train those and get drive out optimization and adoption? Um, it, that's difficult. So sort of in the middle, is this whole change management process. Um, and this is where, you know, we think kind of the, the gotchas are gonna be. You know, sure, the software's great. The vendors have developed really good software. They're gonna support it for you. And assuming you've got great clinicians in your organization, it's all the stuff that happens in between here of making sure that you're evaluating the right products and, and choosing the right vendors, uh, that you're getting good pricing on those things that you have designed and architected the solution properly, uh, implementing it, um, project management, et cetera. And probably the biggest thing is just, you know, let's say you've got it all implemented, it's, it's getting the, the actual end users to embrace the technology, to adopt it, to use it to its fullest extent. So these are some, some of the things that you'll need to think about it and really need to kind of have a game plan and a strategy. Um, in terms of uh, the cost of all this, I mean, it's going to vary depending on which technology products you buy. Um, but one study that was done back in 2019 by Forrester Research gives us kind of a, a good clue as to the level of investment required here. Um, what Forrester found is that for every dollar invested in technology, $3.41 is spent on the services and the infrastructure and support to make it work. And this was a study specific to AI and RPA, which is robotic process automation. So this is a pretty relevant finding. So it's just something to think about is it's not just the cost of the software, it's all the other things, the platform, uh, deploying it, supporting it, uh, caring and feeding for the system that, that you need to consider as well as a part of your strategy. So uh, with that, we'll kind of bring the presentation to a close, uh, a couple of parting thoughts here. Obviously, we think that the future of radiology is going to be heavily dependent on technology, and we have to leverage that technology to um, you know, improve quality, create more value, decrease cost, and uh, obviously improve outcomes for patient care. Um, reasons why it's not deployed everywhere today is uh, certainly there, there's no lack of products out there. There's a, there's a lot of products looking for a home. But within your health system, you know, there's only so much budget to go around. You've got to make a business case. Most health systems we talk to say we want to see an ROI within a year, if that's possible. If it's a tangible, you know, proven ROI that we can get within a year, then, then you know, we're interested in, in taking a look at it. If it's not quite there yet, well, then we're not going to prioritize it, um, is what we're hearing from some folks. Um, the maturity of the product, uh, some of the things that Dr. Kotler mentioned with data and bias and context, all important things. And then, of course, the, the change management aspect of this. But again, all of these hurdles are um, um, you know, going to be overcome in time. And we believe this is going to reach kind of you know, mainstream status over the next few years. Uh, the future of AI or the future of radiology is really going to be AI plus the radiologist, and then working together, we're going to have better care. So uh, this is you know, kind of our thoughts on things. We appreciate everyone's time today. Um, in closing, I just want to thank you for your attendance and thank HCP for hosting us and, and offering us this opportunity to, to present. Um, I believe there's some time here at the end uh, for taking questions. And if you have any questions, feel free to just email them to us directly. The uh, address is imaging at canopy-partners.com. We'll get back to you ASAP. You can also just email the HCP conference organizers and they can forge your message to us. So with that, um, we, uh, we will close the session.
thank you all again for your time, and uh, we really appreciate your attention today. Dr. Kotler, thank you for joining me and for all the great insights that you shared. Appreciate that, and uh, hope everyone has a great rest of the conference, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. Hi, everyone.